All right, let's recap. We, we, we talked about the, the key of David, and uh, this whole message is a summary. I'm going to add something at the end, but um, because I really want us to get this. Uh, I'm going to go quickly on a review, stop as the Holy Spirit leads me, and, and emphasize some things uh, if that's what the Lord wants. But I'm, I'm going to just um, <clears throat> review, highlight some things, underscore some things, because I want you to get it. This is our theme of the year, that God will open doors for us that nobody can shut. He's going to shut doors that nobody can open. And we need to thank God not just for open doors, but closed doors. There are closed doors that the Lord will close so you won't go through them because on the other side of that door is some misery or some heartache or some pain or, or, or something that would be detrimental to your life. Uh, something that, that he will uh, cause you to avoid by closing the door. And uh, so anyway, let's, um, let's jump right in in Revelation 3. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia, I said from the outset that I want Summit Church to be a Philadelphia church. Scholars agree that this was the best church. This church received no rebuke. And uh, this, this church was commended. And uh, these things says he <clears throat> who is holy, who is true, he who has the key of David. This is in red. Uh, um, now this is, so I wanna, I, I want, this is in red. I, I want to underscore this. He who has the key of David and the he who has the key of David. And, and the one who is talking, the one who is holy, the one who is true, he has nothing but truth, is the Lord Jesus Christ. He has currently the key of David. What does he do with this key? He opens and no one shuts and shuts and no one opens. Now, we gave you an example in... Acts 16, when Paul and Silas were in prison, they were in the, the inner prison, and uh, their feet were in the stocks, and they began to worship and praise God. Let me give you the, what the key of David is, y'all. I've said this before, but I want you to get this because this is what causes Jesus to use the key in your life. How many of you want Jesus to open doors for you Amen. that nobody can shut? Yeah. Well, here's the key. Here's, what, here's the key that causes Jesus to use the key. It's prayer, praise, worship, thanksgiving. Say prayer, prayer. Praise, praise, worship, worship. Thanksgiving. thanksgiving. I really, really want you to repeat that about ten times, but I, I don't have time. But Get that, okay? Because uh, if, you, if you forget everything else, understand, just, just get the praise in God. <laughs> Live a lifestyle of praise and prayer, and God's going to use the key. And Jesus is going to use the key in your life and open doors for you. I'm seeing it happening with, uh, with our people right now, and it's exciting, and it will continue to happen. Even though it's the theme of this year, it's going to happen beyond this year. Because Jesus can't help but use the key. When you praise and worship and give God thanks. That's what Paul and Silas did in prison. And there was a great earthquake and the prison doors flung open and the jailer was shocked because he saw, he saw the prison doors open. He was about to kill himself because he saw the prison doors open and that got his attention because he's the one who had those keys. But Jesus had it as the master key. Even though, I mean, he knew that he securely locked that prison with Paul and Silas and other prisoners inside. And he sees this earthquake and the, and the door is open. How are those doors open? Because they worship and praise and thank God. And Jesus used that key. Amen. Amen. They sung the Pascal song, Psalms 113 to Psalm 118 and also Psalm 136. They sang something out of those psalms. According to, I believe it is uh, Thayer's um, commentary. All right? 
And so they begin to sing the Psalms of David. There's something about worshiping and praising with the Psalms of David. Hallelujah. Amen. And uh, so let's, let's look at another scripture, uh, Isaiah 22 from the Message Bible. Isaiah 22, 22. I'll give him, we, we've looked at all these scriptures, okay? But I want to underscore these things and, uh, as we summarize. I'll give him the key of the Davidic heritage. He'll have the run of the place. That's happening right now. Jesus is having the run of the place when you let him into your life. This is the Old Testament saying the same thing as in Revelation. you have the run of the place. What's he going to do? Open any door. <laughs> any, he can open any door. As we saw with Paul and Silas in prison, what man shuts. <laughs> oh, come on, man. I'm getting, I, I don't know if I can get through this. What man shuts, Jesus can open. Any door. Any. Any door. And keep it open. People can try to shut it back. You just come out, glory to God, man. And they try to shut it back and they can't do it. I can't improve upon this, but I gave this illustration about the Chronicles of Narnia. How they were in that closet, that wardrobe closet. And they walked through, and they were in a whole other place. That's what's going to happen. Yes. Well, Pastor, when's it going to happen? Shoot. Just keep worshiping. Keep praising. Yes. Keep giving your worries to God. Keep yes. giving whatever bothers you to God and watch him open the door. And one day you're going to wake up, and you're going to be in another place. Yes. You're going to be in another place. You're going to be in another place. <laughs> All right. And uh, look at Zechariah. And I'm, I want to give you a connection. You say, well, Pastor, well, that was the Old Testament. And then Revelation. Yeah, but what about, what about, is it for now? Yes. Now, uh, hang on. Zechariah 12.10. And I, I will pour out on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace. The spirit of grace and supplication. They're one and the same. We've covered that. Spirit, the spirit of grace and supplication or prayer, what you bring to God. And they will look on me whom they pierced. Yes, they will mourn for him as one who mourns for, for his only son and grieve for, for him as one grieves for a firstborn. I want you to focus on this. This first part, I will pour on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication. When you're flowing in worship, when you're praising and worshiping God, you're flowing in the spirit of grace. And then we, we went to the New Testament and when you see the word thanksgiving, it's very interesting. See, when you, you're flowing in the spirit of grace. I'm going to underscore this. When you are worshiping and praising God, you're flowing in the spirit of grace. You're flowing in the spirit of grace. The word thanksgiving is yun sharis. Sharis is the Greek word for uh, grace. And it's interesting that, that in the word thanksgiving is grace in the New Testament. The word thanksgiving is un sharis. Very interesting. We, we, uh, we looked at that. Now, what about this tabernacle of David? Now, the New Testament connection is in Acts 15. We won't look at this, but in Acts chapter 15, when they were, I mean, Gentiles were getting saved all over the place. I mean, Peter went into Cornelius' house and ministered salvation to them. To them. They, were, they were filled with the Holy Spirit, praise God. And, and so... Um, Peter was reluctant to go until he, God revealed to him in a vision that he, that he should go to uh, minister to these Gentiles. 
Now, up to that time, Jews didn't think Gentiles could be saved. Paul and Barnabas were called to the Gentiles, and they went to minister to the Gentiles, and, and they were seeing all kinds of people getting saved and, and so forth. It was a wonderful time. But uh, there were people that were giving Paul a hard time. They were harassing him because they didn't think that they should be ministering to Gentiles. They thought salvation was just for the Jews. And, and, and uh, even uh, then, they, they, then they said, well, they need to keep the law. So they had a big church meeting about it. The pastor, Pastor James, um, heard the reports and so forth that were coming in about Gentiles being saved, and they had a meeting about it. And finally, he got revelation. I believe he just got revelation. He said, okay, this is what the prophets predicted, that Jesus would return and rebuild, listen to this, rebuild the tabernacle of David. Now, see this verse says, I will pour out on the house of David. Not the tabernacle of Moses. See, we hear a lot about the tabernacle of Moses, but what is the tabernacle of David? And uh, I just recently found out what it was. And we found out that the tabernacle of David is unlimited access to the presence of God. That David set up a tabernacle separate from the tabernacle of Moses. He took the Ark of the Covenant. Once he, he, he recovered the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant in the Old Testament was where the presence of God was. And it was at one time in the tabernacle of Moses. But at, at one point in Israel's uh, history, when the enemy had captured, the Philistines had, had, had captured the Ark of the Covenant, um, and finally they got in trouble because of it, and they finally got rid of it. David recovered it. When he recovered it, when he recovered it, he did not take it to where the uh, tabernacle of Moses was. He took it, he built his own tabernacle. He put it in a tent. He, he took the ark. Y'all following me? Yeah. I'm just reviewing. Now you can go back and get, get, get those other CDs. But he, he took the uh, ark and he put it in his, he built his own tabernacle. Amen. Whereas in the tabernacle of Moses, it's important that you understand this. In the tabernacle of Moses, there were procedures. There was the outer court, there was the inner court, there was the, the holy place, the, most, the, the altar of incense and all of that, and the, 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 the holy of holies. And there were procedures. Only the high priest could go in to the most holy place. But in the tabernacle of David, it's interesting. When David set up this tabernacle, the tabernacle of Moses was still intact. But he chose not to take the ark to the tabernacle of Moses. He set up his own tabernacle. And this tabernacle had no procedures. I don't know if we have that diagram. If we have that diagram, you can throw it up there. If not, I'll just explain it to you. It was direct access to the presence of God. They could just go, there it is right there. Unrestricted access to the presence of God. They just go right in. 24 hours. David set up a tabernacle where it had, they still had priests, but they would lead the people in, and, and, and the people could come in uh, 24 hours a day. Seven days a week. Unrestricted access to the presence of God. James said, in his conclusion about all these Gentiles being saved, whether they should keep the law, he said, no, this is what, this is what the prophets predicted. This is what the prophets talked about, that the Lord will come and rebuild the tabernacle of David. So this is New Testament, y'all. This is not something in yesteryear. Jesus is still rebuilding the tabernacle of David. James was saying, everybody, Jews, Gentiles, everybody could come in to, to the presence of God. Let's look at um, Hebrews or Ephesians 2.18. For through him we both have access by one spirit to the Father. Hebrews 4, I'm reading these quickly. Hebrews 4.16, you can jot them down. Come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace 
to help in time of need. Hallelujah. Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus. By a new and living way. It's a new way. And that's what people were all uptight. People are uptight now about grace. It scares them. But just look at Jesus. They had all these procedures. The Pharisees, they, they were, oh man, these, these guys were so legalistic. I'm going to do some study on the Pharisees. They had all, so, so many times they prayed. And so they had all this stuff that they did. And they, when Jesus came on the scene, everybody just come to him. People wanted healing. He didn't, he didn't uh, interview them and say, okay, are you in sin? Uh, let me see, do you really qualify to get my healing? No, man, Jesus didn't interview nobody. He didn't turn anybody away. Okay, now, okay, what, what, yeah, let me see, uh, are, you, uh, are you praying enough? Are you, you in your word? It's interesting, when you read the Bible, and don't have religious eyeglasses on. You just look at it the way it is. Jesus never qualified any blessings. He just gave it to him. He just gave it away. Amen. Come to me, all you that labor. Heavy laden. All you who's in works. <laughs> all you that working, trying to work in the law, works of the law. And let me give you rest. Come and learn about me. I am meek and lowly in heart. You shall find R-E-S-T. Rest for your souls. For my yoke is hard. No, it's easy. And my burden is light. What religion likes to do is just heave a whole lot of stuff on you. Uh, you, need, you want God to bless you. See. What you need to do, you need to start coming to church. <laughs> See? You need to you know that person you, uh, you dating right now, really not even for you, so you need to leave that person alone. So you, you, you get that straight, and you start spending more time in the Word. How much time are you reading the Bible? <laughs> See, what religion wanted is to hump all of this stuff on us. And you get in a trick bag with that because the devil, whenever, whenever you're trying to do performance to get God to bless you, you will never win that game. But no, none of us are perfect. Right? And then what the devil will do will always pull up. Yeah, I know you read two chapters in the Bible. You should have read three. You read, you read three, you should have read four. You read four, you should have read five. You pray for 15 minutes. You should have prayed 30 minutes. There ain't no time. See, the devil will always bring something up that you're not doing. But oh, it's a happy day when you get revelation of God's grace and you offer this performance kick, you offer this hamster wheel of trying to do it, it, get God to accept you. He already accepts you. But that's, man, that's a whole nother subject. There's a new way. Having boldness to enter the holiness by the blood of Jesus. Look at verse 20. This new, there's, a new, there's a new way. You may not have that verse. Let me read it to you. By a new and living way, which he consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh. Okay, now man, we've covered some good ground. Now, uh, let's jump into oh, let me see. Oh yeah, we talked about this. Before the devil steals your victory, he steals your praise. And when people get into complaining, and, and so you have to be taught, oh yeah, let me, this is so important. You have to be taught about how to praise and worship because the opposite of that is complaining. 
complaining about life, complaining about your circumstances. That's a natural thing to do. You have to be taught how to worship and praise and give God thanks. You have to be taught how to do this. And we're, we're going to do this as we're training our worship team. We're going to um, help you to worship. We want you to, I'm on a mission, y'all. I want you to worship. Now, it's easy for you to get in concert mode and watch, because that's what we're used to. Huh? Anybody been in churches where you watch, and you don't get excited, and you know, and I'm not against that, I, I do some of that too, but it's all about knowing what you're doing, and it's all about entering in yourself, yes. as opposed to watching somebody else enter in. Yes. We, want you, we want you to enter into the presence of God, so you can take this, it's a, it's a rehearsal, so that you can go home and do it yourself. Yes. Why is that important that I do that? I already told you. That's what causes Jesus to use the key. Hallelujah. So you want him to open doors that nobody can shut? Amen. And you do it as a response to his love. Yes. Yes. Huh? We've been forgiven much. Once you understand what God did for you on, on the cross, you'll never be the same. Once you really get the fact that your sins are forgiven, you'll fear no more. Neither will you be lacking. You know that you'll understand that there's nothing he won't do for you. So you can bring anything to God. And he'll take care of it. Now, let's, let's go to the cave. Y'all ready to go to the cave? All right. First Samuel. And let's wrap this up here. Are y'all getting something out of this series? David therefore departed from there and escaped to the cave of Adullam. Say the cave of Adullam. So when his brothers and all his father's house heard it, they went down there to him. And everyone, say everyone, everyone. who was in distress, everyone who was in debt, and everyone who was discontented gathered to him, so he became captain over them, and there were about 400 men with him. Let me tell you something. These men that came with him. And now David himself was running from Saul, the king, who was after his head, trying to kill him. And now he's got the 3D army. In debt, distress, Discontented. Huh? David himself was afraid. That's why he's in the cave hiding. But everyone who was in distress, debt, and discontented came to him. It was about 400 men in all. These men, oh, this is my conclusion right now. These men became his mighty army. These men became captains. Now, write this down. Psalm 34, which we looked at last week. I'm not going to get into this other psalm, but that Psalm 37 were psalms that David wrote when he was in the cave. If you have a good Bible, all Bibles are good Bibles, but, um, but a better Bible will show you before each psalm 
uh, it, it, it'll show you before Psalm 34 and th Psalm 37 that these were Psalms of David when he was in the cave, when he was in the cave, when he was in the cave, all right? So you may be here today. You're in the right place if, if you're, maybe you're in debt. Maybe you're discontented. Maybe you're in distress, okay? Now listen, it's not, not time to go to sleep, y'all. I want you to get this. Um, they came to him, and we're going to see that, we're going to see how these men turned out. See, uh, they began to worship and they began to praise because David set the example. He's in trouble. They're in debt, distress, and discontented. And we looked at Psalm 34. Let's, we won't read all of it. But let's look at, at one of these psalms that he wrote when he was in the cave. He's doing this. He, and I believe he's singing this. He's, he's a psalmist. He's singing. I will bless the Lord sometimes. Psalm 34. I will bless the Lord when? At all times. In season, out of season. When you're in trouble. Some people, they, they stop praising God. They, they praise God when the times are good, but when times are bad, they stop praising him. But David wasn't like that. When he was in trouble, man, that's what he thought about. That was his mindset. There's a reason why Jesus calls this the key of David. It's the key of David, man. And, and, and boy, I tell you what, it, if you can understand this, when you begin to pray and praise and give God thanks, boy, you wake him up, man. You know, Jesus himself, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He prayed with a psalm of David when he was on the cross. Don't tell me the psalms of David are not powerful. Amen. Jesus himself. Amen. Now, just imagine yourself. You come here in trouble. You come in here dead, distressed, discontented. Hallelujah. Now, David is not here, but the greatest son of David is the Lord Jesus. Yes. And he's right here in our midst. Yes. Yes. And we're gathered to him. Yes. Yes. Oh, you just, yeah, some of y'all missed it. We're gathered to him. Yes. Yes. This is a gathering right now. Yes. I know you see me up here. But there's more up here than me. There's more out there than me. The Lord is here. The anointing is here. The Holy Spirit is here to bring you out of distress and, and debt and discontentment. I will bless the Lord at all times. He's in the cave singing this. His praise shall continually be in my mind. Some people just want to praise God when they get their check. Uh, they get an increase and, and they see something, the door, a door open. I'm talking about right now, you're missing, some of y'all are missing a good time to give God some praise and give God some thanks. Some of y'all, it's all right to be in the cave, but don't be in there pouting and, and crying and complaining. You need to, know, need to know what to do when you're in the cave. I'm going to bless the Lord. Right now. Huh? Lock yourself up in your cave and begin to worship and praise God. He said, oh, magnify the Lord with me. He's not by himself. The, the 3D army in front of him, magnify the Lord with me. Don't y'all just look at me. Yeah, that's what he's telling them. I mean, basically, magnify. Come on, come on, y'all. Come on, 3D army. Let's exalt his name together. Oh, man, come on now. I sought the Lord, and he heard me and delivered me from all my fears. They, they who? Come on, y'all. Verse 5. They, 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 who? The 3D army looked to him and were radiant. Hallelujah. See, as they saw 
David praising, they entered into praise God and they began to praise God and they were radiant and their faces were not ashamed. The, this poor man cried out and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around all those, even though you can't see them, you got the angels who watch over you. Hallelujah. Angels who are, have been sent to minister for those who inherit salvation. Angels who excel in strength, according to Psalm 103, hearkening to the voice of his word. Look at this. The angel of the Lord encamps all around those who fear him and delivers him. Oh, my goodness. This fear, you need to know what this is. Well, you know what it means to fear the Lord? Jesus interpreted that. You know, when Jesus, I may have mentioned this last week, I don't know. But it's good right here. Because he encamps around those who what? Fear him. Watch this. When Jesus was tempted of, of the devil in, in the wilderness, in one of the temptations, the, the devil tried to get him to, you know, uh, to worship him. And Jesus said, you shall, I think I did mention this the, or last time, I, not last week, but last time I shared this anyway. Um, Jesus said, you shall, the devil tried to get him to bow down and worship him. And, and, and he said, and Jesus said, uh, you shall worship the Lord only. You shall worship the Lord your God only. Okay, he was, he was quoting from Deuteronomy. But Deuteronomy says, you shall fear the Lord. Jesus interpreted it as worship. Deuteron he was quoting, it was a direct quote from Deuteronomy, the same passage where Jesus said, you shall fear the Lord Excuse me, Jesus said you shall worship the Lord. Deuteronomy said you shall fear the Lord. Jesus said you shall worship the Lord. Jesus interpreted the fear of the Lord as the worship of the Lord. So you know what it means to fear the Lord? It means to worship the Lord. How do I fear God? Not being scared of God. God doesn't want us scared of him, terrified of him. The fear of God means the worship of God. The angels encamp around all those who worship him. You cause the angels to come on the scene and work on your behalf. Then it goes on to say, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. There is no want to those who worship him. Oh, man, all right, how can you miss this? The young lions lack and suffer hunger, but those who seek the Lord shall not lack any good thing. Who is the man who desires life and loves many good days? Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. Peter quotes that. He that will love life and see good days, good days. We talked about having good days. That's on a regular, right? I mean, but on occasion, see, the Bible talks about the evil day. We talked about that in Ephesians. talks about Ephesians 6, put on, I believe, Ephesians 6, 13, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, singular. On occasion, as you live in good days, you will have an evil day. But you're going to have many, many, many good days. You're going to have a good days on a regular. On occasion, you'll have an evil day. And see, and you know what to do on the evil day. Give God worship and give God praise. Hallelujah. Now then, let me, let me tell you what happened. As Jesus turned the key, these men who were in debt, distress, discontent, this 3D army, they became powerful, mighty men of God. They became captains and, and, and great men. Those that came that were in, in debt, Jesus, see, they began, they began to what? Worship and praise. Jesus turned that key, and they became prosperous men. Those, were, those who were in distress, they begin to worship God. 
Jesus turned their key. Yes. And they became joyful, happy, yes. and bright. Yes. Those were, who were discontented, they praised God and Jesus used that key and they became peaceful men. What are you going to do? You going to use that key? Now, let me talk about some of these men in 2 Samuel. You can read verses 8 all the way through the end of the chapter. It talks about these are the same men who were in that cave. Now, this word is a doozy here. Jashib Basibeth is one of these men. He's a guy, he killed 800 men at one time. At one time, y'all. Eleazar was with David when they defiled the Philistines. Now, in this situation, the, the men of Israel, everybody else, had retreated. But this guy, Eleazar, he killed the Philistines until he stood with David. When all the other men retreated, he stood with David and killed the Philistines until he was too tired to lift his sword. Now, all of this is in this chapter. I'm just highlighting uh, some of these guys. Shama, man, the Philistines gathered together in battle in a field full of uh, lentils. And he stood in the middle of that field where the Philistines had gathered for, uh, to, to, uh, to attack Israel. He stood in the middle of that field and killed them all. He said, same guy, debt, distress, distress Discontinued. They became David's mighty army. Abishai, it says, killed 300 men with his spear. And this is my favorite one, Benaiah. Benaiah struck down a lion in a pit on a snowy day. No, wait, 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 wait. It's hard enough. To whoop a lion when it's not snowing. I, I love the scripture. How, 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 I mean, th that's there for a reason. He whooped this. I mean, th th this guy is with a lion inside of a pit in a tight space on a snowy day. He's probably slipping. And he killed that lion. And it mentions another thing that Benai did. He struck down an Egyptian. Benai had a staff in his hand. The Egyptian had a sword. He came at the Egyptian with his staff, snatched the sword from the Egyptian, and killed him with his own sword. Wow. Same guy who was in, he was a part of the 3D army, but because of praise and worship and thanksgiving and Jesus using the key, these guys, Benai and these other fellows, became great and mighty warriors. There's hope for you today. No matter what your situation, you, you can become Jesus' mighty warrior. Who glory to God.